Mr. Thompson, where are you zooming in from? Where's your picture? We'd like to know. I am on the stairs in that photo on the uh, Supreme Court stairs looking at the Capitol. Thank you. It's um, awkwardly quiet in here while we wait for everybody to join us. So thanks for helping with that. Do you need Jimmy to tell some jokes or something? I was hoping you would karaoke. Okay, what song would you like me to sing? Taylor Swift, any of them? I don't know any Taylor Swift songs. Forget you. Councilmember Johnstone. Councilmember Riggs. Happily here. Councilmember Thompson. Here. Councilmember Goodson. Uh, here. Councilmember Weber. Here. Vice Mayor Smith. Here. Mayor Pittman. Here. Uh, we did uh, conclude it. Uh, we'll be returning to uh, That'll be repeated. Uh, and announcements. Uh, Would you all come up and introduce yourselves? Thank you for inviting us to lead your meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. We are part of the Over Elementary School Student Council. Hello, my name is Max Duran. Hello, my name is Callie Anaya. My name is Colin Corona. My name is Jacob Felix. We are a country with a diverse popula uh, what, what did I say? Wrong. population. <laughs> say the Pledge of Allegiance is a sense of patriotism all over. Saying the Pledge of Allegiance helps form a connection to our country, the United States of America. When we say the Pledge of Allegiance of wait, when we say the Pledge of Allegiance, we honor the flag and everything it represents. We say the pledge to start our day at school, to begin official meetings or ceremonies, and even special events like ball games. We would like to lead you in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand. Salute. Pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, my name is Jennifer Cooper, and I'm a teacher at Ofer Elementary School. And these are a few of our student council representatives. Thank you very much. Mr. Mayor, if I may, yes, just a comment. Please. Yeah, so uh, Ofer, Gophers, you go. Now, I was a PTO president up there. And I don't remember having a student council, but I am extremely proud of what you just accomplished here. And you guys did an awesome job. Yeah. yeah. Well done. Well done. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming. Future leaders. Yes. Awesome. Current leaders. Current leaders. Yes. <laughs> I stand corrected. Thank you. You're welcome to stay, but we get long and deleterious in our conversations. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Great job, thank All right, great job. job. With some changes in the way we have to conduct meetings, we're going to ask the city attorney to make some explanations for tonight. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, one of the changes that came into effect on January 1 uh, is a change in the Brown Act pursuant to uh, AB 2449, which allows a, an elected official to participate remotely based on one of the reasons in the code, if you, if you comply with one of the reasons in the code. And it, it, it's under the code that, that, that is uh, um, entitled either for just cause or for an emergency circumstance. As you note, know, Council Member Thompson is participating from our nation's capital. I believe it's the nation's capital. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and uh, one of the just cause reasons is travel while on official business of the legislative body or another state or local agency. He is in Washington, D.C. as a chaperone for a school uh, field trip of students, which qualifies as another local agency. He is on official business, so he, he is allowed to participate remotely without any prior notice, without any modification of the agenda. The, the add-on that comes with that, in the event that anyone, and I noticed there's one attendee right now, just a moment ago there were none, any attendee who wishes to make a comment on an agenda item or on a non-agenda item will have the opportunity to do so. So we will need to make, uh, and every, and by the way, every vote needs to be a roll call vote, mm -hmm. uh, so that it, so that you know, it, it, it's abundantly clear as to, as to how the voting goes. Um, although again, we can we can certainly utilize in this instance we have the, uh, the voting system. We can use the voting system, and and Councilmember Thompson can announce his vote because it's shown on the screen. Um, and I'll, I'll mention this to staff. If we do have any technological difficulties, please let me know immediately because we've got to then stop the meeting and, and get that corrected right away. Um, but then the other the other um, item again for uh, to uh, to facilitate public comment, um, Mr. Mayor, when you do call call for public comment on each item, you can simply state anyone online raise your hand via or on Zoom utilize the raise your hand function, and if someone wants to comment, they can click raise hand and then we'll allow them to comment by remotely. Um, it's not ne they're not required to comment, but if they would like to comment, they can. Thank you. Does council all understand? Thank you. Next item is adoption of the agenda. I move that we adopt the agenda. A second. We moved and seconded. Can we have a roll call vote? Councilmember Thompson, how do you vote? Yes. And again, the rest of you can just hit your button, and it does it does show up on the screen. Okay. Motion carries with seven yeses and zero noes. Thank you. Um, next item is <clears throat> the, uh, just to let you all know, the presentation of the Orville High School cheer, cheering squads has been rescheduled for March the 7th, and it'll be a special meeting that had been planned to be up at the police fire facility at 2055 Lincoln, and there we'll have adequate room to uh, allow both the cheering teams and some others that uh, received significant recognitions uh, at the police fire facility, which will also be a council meeting at the facility and uh, the public will be invited in to see the new remodeling and those things happen. So that'll be on Tuesday, March 7th at 2055 Lincoln Street. Um, item number two, introduction of code enforcement staff to council. Mr. Belser, thank you, sir. Good evening, Mayor Pittman and Council. I'm here to introduce my code enforcement team to you tonight. Um, in January 22, the City of Orville um, and Council made code enforcement its standalone department. Um, I was able to build a department and uh, hire several amazing employees. Um, some of the duties that they cover, they, they monitor and enforce a variety of code enforcement or municipal codes. They deal with building uh, violations, uh, contractors working without a permit, uh, health and safety codes, um, deal with a lot of the homeless issues that we have in our city. And they're an uh, uh, amazing group at educating our citizens. My code enforcement team, they are strong, courageous people. They are um, dedicated to learning and implementing what they learn out into the field. 
Um, they're safe, they have a positive work ethic, camaraderie, dedication, and take absolute pride into improving our city. Uh, they have learned the partnership with other, other resources that we have in the city and outside of our city. We use, uh, utilize public works a lot. Um, housing navigation, we, they introduce a housing navigator to subjects that are at risk of homelessness or homeless and get them whatever resources they can to get their life back on track, get them off the, off the streets. And they work closely with the um, police department and the municipal law enforcement. Um, together, they're, they're a great team. We utilize, I'll show during my PowerPoint presentation, some other partners that we use as well. But they're really good at taking direction and knowing what resources that are needed when we deal with, with certain situations. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do the PowerPoint presentation next, and then I'll introduce um, my team. When we talk about the goal for um, code enforcement, we like to obtain voluntary compliance. We're not mean. We don't like go out and threaten people. We don't. We like to educate. And the biggest thing we like to do is make sure that the health and safety of our citizens is, is secure. We, we protect any way we can when it falls under municipal codes or the health and safety codes. Um, knowledge is empower. Applied knowledge is power. I can put these guys through endless training. Um, you can put anybody through endless training, but if you don't implement what you're trained or what you're learning, it doesn't really mean a lot. And to these guys, everything that they have trained to do, have learned to do, um, you know, they implement it out in the field and in the office. And that includes how we treat the people we work with. We're a training-driven organization. Um, these guys get a lot of training, and you're going to see what kind of training they get. And like I say, they, they're like sponges. You know, it, it's amazing, especially at their age, you, you kind of, it's a lot easier to teach young people, but these guys are amazing. These are some of the uh, courses that they have to go through and some of the training they do. And you'll see an S next to the end of some of those. Those have a safety implement in all of them. When uh, State Bill 296 was passed, which talked about the safety of code enforcement officers and the type of training that they were going to get and how we were going to document the training that they received. You see that they do a 832 40-hour laws of arrest class and clutch training, which gives them access to um, run license plates for abandoned vehicles. Legal update, which is always important. Um, you know, automotive repair investigation fraud. We have a lot of that in our city where individuals think they're mechanics and they do work without licenses and they ruin people's vehicles. Uh, violence emergency response, they learn how to stay safe out in the field. You know, there's customer service and de-escalation. I'm huge on de-escalation with everything that they do. We're, we're trying to communicate with citizens and they understand that whatever the citizens going through at that time might not have to be with what they're there for. They have other stuff going on in their life and they're really, really good at talking to people. The due process to make sure everybody's noticed properly with what's going on, that nothing's a surprise to them. And wellness and self-care, their own self-care, their own mental health, how important that is, and the recognized signs when um, they might be going through something and need to reach out to counseling and, and what options they have through the city, the counseling options. And then fourth option, de-escalation. That was a class put on by Butte College where I had code enforcement go work with law enforcement just to see what police do and what they have to deal with and how to avoid those type of conflicts. Um, we sent several to our, our code enforcement conference in Southern California. Um, as you can see, it's just ongoing pepper spray exposure. Um, we review policy on a regular basis. Situational awareness, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that was a, a lengthy class where they had to take an exam and, and they were actually um, given certificates for that. And then the Module 1 Academy in Sacramento, which is, there's three modules to becoming a, a actual full-fledged um, code enforcement officer, and some of them got to finish um, Module Number 1. So some of the certificates that they earn, you know, through different agencies and, and that put on the trainings, and we keep those uh, hard copy, we keep an electronic file, and I also um, developed an Excel spreadsheet to, to manage their training. This is a spreadsheet here. It'll show what training they've done, and this is just in the year that they've been with us. Some of us, some of them have been with us less than a year. 
a lot of training, who put it on, when it expires, so they know the next time they have to get trained. So what's that total of 131 hours of training over the last year and 118 hours had some type of safety element. So they do not get hurt out in the field, you know, and they can recognize hazards inside the offices that they work in. Our partners, like I talked about law enforcement, uh, public works, city works, the MLEs, behavioral health, animal control, housing, navigation. Sometimes we have every one of these individuals out at a location and they work well of, of um, work well together. They know when they need to be involved and when they are not to be involved. Okay. Talk about this, there's some photos with some of our partners, um, you know, help cleaning up camps. Sometimes we need the police presence there because the people we're dealing with are uncooperative. And again, you see animal control up there that we took nine dogs off of this property that were left there abandoned. The MLEs are really good about going out and helping us abate uh, camps, contact people. Um, you know, it's just an ongoing effort. It's not just code enforcement. I say it's the entire city that puts efforts towards um, the things that we need to get done. Community involvement, I think it's really important to be part of the, the community and put ourselves out there. I teamed them up with Shop with a Cop this year with law enforcement and at uh, Walmart where Students get to come to Walmart and shop with police officers and they, and they assist in any type of wrapping or shopping that needs to be done. The point in time survey as a county, we go out and, and uh, document homeless and interview them. They volunteer in that. So talk about productivity um, for the case stats for 2022. If you look, we've towed 380 abandoned vehicles away from private and public parking areas. Uh, building code violations, 239. A lot of those are stop work notices where uh, contractors, some that weren't licensed, were doing construction in our city. Make sure that the individuals that live in the homes or get the construction work done are done by licensed people and it's inspected by our city inspectors. And 527 public nuisances. And these are homes that might have junk trash and debris out in front of them, um, businesses that aren't maintaining uh, their trash receptacles. So again, stop work notice is 146. We used to do, prior to uh, implementing this program, we would do about four to 10 a year, if we were lucky, just because there wasn't the manpower out there to, to find these contractors that were doing work without permits or licenses. So we look at our case stats. In this last year, we opened up 1,442 cases and closed 1,403. And right now we have 192 active cases um, it's actually we're down to about 142 right now. So when we look at it, compliance rate, we get 97.2% out of the citizens. And that comes from the way that my team treats people, treats our citizens, even ones that can't afford to do what they're doing. We find out ways to get them help, either through churches, through our city works program, anything to get compliance. And one of the big things we do is, is educating citizens. And my team... Um, we're missing a staff assistant right now. They answer the phone. So somebody gets to talk to a live human when they call our office. And I listen to them from my office and it's constant education about how to resolve the issues, where, who to call, you know, if you don't have the money or the means or aren't physically able, you know, we, we get them help. And they're amazing at talking to people. I love listening to talk to people. So when we talk about our success, you know, coming together is a beginning and keeping together is progress, but working together is success. We all work together. We, we don't have um, issues inside a department as, you know, yet, but we work well together. They're a great team. I love listening to them talk about cases back and forth. Um, we do a lot of giggling at times and, and uh, you know, which is important at the workplace too, but they're, they're a great team and, and great group to work with. If anybody's interested in how to get a hold of us, there's some <clears throat> phone numbers up there. There's, you know, um, how to file a complaint with the city, or you can go online to our website, look up code enforcement. Complaint form is right there digitally if you want to do it that way, or you can just email us at the uh, code um, email. Okay. At this time, I, I would just like to introduce my group. Um, there's actually one missing. Um, she couldn't make it tonight, and that's Willow Emberland. But uh, Julio Salcido, he's been with me the longest. Mm -hmm. um, he's been here since the program's been implemented. Good evening. Thanks. Nice to meet you. This is Matthew Cervantes. 
San Bernardino kid. He's an LA kid. We got Chris Billington. This is relatively new. His father, Al Billington, you guys should know, he was an a officer and a sergeant here for many years at the Oroville Police Department. Mm. And then um, Pania and Pa Cha Vang. And these two have been with me since... <laughs> seven years. Mm -hmm. They've been with me since the implement of the MLE program. Uh, they came from the MLE program down to code enforcement. Uh, amazing, amazing group of people. You guys can scoot in. It's okay if you fall. Mm -hmm. But great group of people yeah. and some of the hardest working people I've ever worked with. Thank, Thank you. you all. Uh, Councilman Goodson, questions? Um, just an observation. What I did notice is that we work closely together, daily, nightly basis, yeah. whenever you get a text. And one thing that I, you did not mention was the close interaction with the city code enforcement attorney, Sam Emerson. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to give him a shout out, um, Mr. Huber. Uh, he has really uh, worked wonders with once we had voted in the standalone code enforcement department and uh, been very instrumental, if I'm not correct, in, in the training of receiverships, liens, et, et cetera. Um, so I just want to give a shout out. Very impressive. Thank you. Yeah. Thank Council you, Councilman. Councilman Johnson. Thank you. I just want to um, congratulate your te you and your team. Uh, you can see the results and how hard you all work. Um, on a daily basis, and I know that it's it's rough because you see different areas that, that need to be cleaned up, you see you out there cleaning it up, and then the next day they're back or the next day. So I just commend you all for the hard work that you do. We really appreciate it. Keep up the good work. I do have a question as far as I know um, code enforcement complaints are uh, confidential. What is the average time frame between somebody filing a complaint? Let's just say for even vehicle abatement, um, you know, something as simple as vehicle abatement. What, as if a constituent asks us, hey, I, there's a problem here, or there's a problem there, um, and I'm not hearing anything back from code enforcement or from public works or whoever's going to be dealing with it. What's the average time frame between? So everything is based on priority and you know health and safety stuff that's a hazard we'll deal with immediately uh, most of our uh, abandoned vehicles are a health and safety hazard you know people are entering them they're sleeping in the middle of the night they're stripping parts off of them so that stuff almost happens immediately and then we go out there and determine whether it's on private property or public property if it's public property and it's open accessible to the public where they can gain access to it it'll go right when we roll up so and then you know we go through our procedure of, of notifying the registered owners and and to make sure they understand where their car went um, you know a lot of the cases are very complicated that these guys deal with and they're time consuming a lot of it comes through with the notification I mean you have to research especially for dealing with a property who has interest in a property who owns the property is it owned by a bank by a citizen sure. and a corporation and you have to notice every one of those individuals and a lot of the notices that we do um, to make sure they've been notified they go out certified mail so and that in and of itself takes time so it, again it's just a case-by-case -case basis it's based on priority this group right here, I mean, we read our, every morning we have a, a procedure that we do. We read our emails, we get our complaints, and then we start addressing them. And then once those complaints are addressed, then they'll go out and do their inspections from the previous cases. But some of these cases will take over a year to get some type of, you know, uh, resolution. And, and a lot of it, you know, some of the more complicated ones, they, they, we go through abatement warrant process or go through the warrant process just to get on the property to secure it, you know, like people squatting in abandoned houses. So. I appreciate that and keep up the good work. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, before you get down, I've got to add to it. Uh, I think that a lot of times people see a property and then uh, they wonder um, the time factor and all that. I, I, I've shared with you a number of addresses. And the beauty thing that happens when all of us get a phone call and we, you know, transfer that to 
uh, that department and Mr. Belser, they, they know the address. They've been working it for quite a while. And you guys are um, got a great motivation to clean up the town. And sometimes it doesn't show, but I got to tell you, um, there's a lot of them out there. And uh, for every reason in the world, as you mentioned, uh, time sometimes gets slow. Yeah. But, um, uh, you know, the things that I'll tell you to the public is send a few pictures in if it's a problem that you haven't seen addressed. Send the pictures in. They're, they're addressed by this department, and um, they appreciate that, com that communication from you. So don't hesitate to let these folks know what's going on. So we appreciate that. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Uh, this now is the time for any public communication and hearing of non-agenda items. Do we have any cards? Mr. Mayor, I have two blue speaker cards. Our first speaker is Janice Titanser. I am Janice Titanser. I've been the president of the PAWS organization for 25 years. Mm -hmm. This is probably not a good evening. I, I had two hours sleep last night, so I'm not drugged, I promise you. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't, right. I'm tired. Um, I'm here to talk to you today. Um, it, you seem like to be a very caring and kind and knowledgeable people to me. And what I'm here to talk about is the SPCA. The SPCA receives over a million dollars a year to gather, house, and euthanize overpopulation of pits. When I was eight years old, I went to a animal shelter in the river bottoms of Marysville, between Marysville and uh, Linda, to get my friend a puppy for her birthday. I was shocked and appalled at uh, what I witnessed there at, at the age of eight years old. And I'm here to tell you that 65 years later, we now have bigger and better facilities, million dollar buildings. Animal control officers are paid a great deal of money. The CEO of the nonprofits make six-figure incomes. I've done it as a volunteer for 25 years. I don't want to take away from the animals. But th what you see when you walk in those facilities and you leave the shining lobby is deplorable. SPCA is Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Animals. It was founded in 1824 to take care of the horses that were pulling the delivery trucks, and it's worldwide now. But there's no SPCA police. Anyone can call themselves an SPCA, and it depicts us it because it's their mission to house, give safe protection, food, water, comfort, love, find homes for. It's supposed to be a safe haven for animals. And the SPCA is deplorable absolutely deplorable the ways the animals are housed and kept until they're killed. Many of them are sick and they don't receive medical attention because they're going to kill them. Why should they put money in them? It's better than it was uh, about seven years ago. The kill rate was 90 to 95 percent in the SPCA. That was pretty sad. It's better now. I'm, I'm hoping that it's better now because of the pause efforts down the street. We uh, spay and neuter sometimes our, our record for a daily surgery day. I'm Mrs. Titan, sorry, we sorry we got your three minutes are concluded. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. If you leave them with the clerk, we appreciate that. Thank you. Sorry, your time's up. Do 
was the other next? Our floor? next speaker is Bill Spear. Mr. Spear. Vice Mayor, City Council. Come to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Here on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'm going to pray for the SPCA. Thank you, Jesus. That um, we continue to bless the organization to take care of all of the, the animals. And I see that the Orville Rescue Mission is on the agenda also. And I'd like to thank God for them and for their faithfulness of years and years of being there for the least of these. And the Hope Center. Um, we have so many wonderful organizations in our city, uh, our code enforcement, top notch. Um, real extremely proud of the people that serve in our city and want to continue to stand beside them in prayer and uh, move forward with the, the blessings of God, acknowledging, thank God for um, the uh, event coming up where we're going to honor the youth at the, during the city council meeting. It's uh, important to, to honor. And um, on the Lord's Prayer that I just prayed, um, there's a section that says, forgive us our debts as we forgive those, our debtors. And, you know, as we move forward and the election's <coughs> over, I pray that we would um, get past all that and um, work together even better and for our, for our community and um, empower each other. You know, I'm extremely proud of the city helping the Orville Rescue Mission, empowering them to do mm -hmm. um, the work that they're doing and, and working alongside with the, the Hope Center and the, the city works you know, that is really big, and it really makes a difference in the, the least of these, those that um, are trying to get their lives together. I've seen so many um, miracles and so many changed lives because of the people in our town. And um, Thank you, sir. Do we have any more? Mr. Mayor, that is the last of the public speakers for non-agenda items. Do we have anyone online that wishes to speak? I'm not seeing any hands raised online. Your microphone is not. If anyone online would like to make a, a comment on non-agenda items, please use the raise hand function. Mr. Mayor, I don't see any. I don't see any either. All right, um, next item is the consent calendar. Anyone wish to uh, pull an item from the consent calendar? I wish to pull item number six. Okay. Number six, anyone else? If not, then I entertain a motion to move the consent calendar. I move that we approve the consent calendar exempt agenda item six. A second. And we'll have roll call. Council member Thompson, how do you vote? Yes. Motion carries with seven yeses and zero noes. Councilman Riggs, was it the what, item number six? Yes, I was interested in hoping that staff could share the specifications of the grant and what, if any, oversight we would have if um, if that 
BDO, as they call it, was approved and in place, what environmental or safety oversight might we have in approving such facilities? Wow. <laughs> um, I know, that's a big question, I'm sorry. West Urban City Planner. Uh, the BDO is a proposed biodiversity uh, opportunity zone, uh, similar to an enterprise zone. Uh, there are a number of them uh, throughout the world, and they are being promoted by, by an organization. Uh, there's one in Arlington, Oregon. There's one in uh, Salome Springs, Arkansas. There's one in Barnwell County, South Carolina. There's one in Melville, Saskatchewan in Canada. And uh, this is a grant application to work with the sponsor of these BDO zones uh, in order to evaluate Butte County, not just Oroville, but to evaluate Butte County in terms of its attractiveness to biomass um, manufacturing plants. Uh, these are not the traditional, we have, and we have one comment letter uh, from someone who is concerned about the environmental uh, problems that might be caused uh, by you know, just burning wood chips and things like that. Uh, that is not the intent of this uh, biodiversity zone. The intent of it is to uh, attract manufacturing and, and other businesses that generate clean energy, reduce clean greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I don't know the specifications of the application. Uh, it is not due until uh, mid-February, and so everything that's being developed now is in draft form. Uh, the city of Oroville has uh, lots of industrial land. Uh, there is a plethora of forest biomass, as we know from all the fires and, and uh, that have happened here recently. Uh, there is a lot of ag waste out west of here. A lot of it is being burned. Um, just going up in smoke right now. A lot of it is going to landfills. And our goal is to, uh, in economic development uh, as staff, uh, is to attract biomass plants that will utilize this, uh, this waste material and convert it to useful products, uh, clean energy products. And some of the products that, that can be developed are uh, hydrogen generation, uh, which is the primary purpose of the Yosemite Clean project uh, that is proposed here, uh, jet fuel, electricity, uh, recycled natural gas, and uh, other products that are used as clean energy and that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, I've answered some of the parts of your question. I'm not if, sure I've answered if all If I could them. jump in, uh, Wes, I think I can maybe help with this. This is a letter of support for a grant application. This does not relinquish any of our rights to any regulatory authority or building approvals that will be necessary to construct this in the city. This is something that if someone at some point decided to build something, it has to come back to the city council. It will go through a development process, and all of those issues will be addressed at this time. This is not an application to build anything. You know, and we're not turning any dirt. We're trying to uh, just show a letter of support to uh, a potential grant to see what is the um, ability or benefit to uh, Oroville, Butte County to have something like this in our community. Well stated, thank you. <laughs> Yet we don't have the specifications of what they're applying for within that grant. They're applying for a grant to see if we are a suitable location for uh, a facility, as Mr. Irvin mentioned. We, we have We're not actually applying to build anything. Nothing's going I to be built. I understand that. That's clear in the staff report. Mm -hmm. My question is the specifications about exactly what their their grant application involves. What What's their end goal? What is What are the uh, final application of that grant? That's we what have since received uh, some more information about these BDO zones, uh, about the risk assessments that they perform. Uh, about the environmental reviews and such. So I'd like to make that available to the council. Okay. Um, Thank you. And essentially that grant is a review of our community to make sure that, or to ensure that we're either an A or a double A rating so that we are 
um, attractive to those uh, biomass manufacturers. So that overlay zone would be, like I said, the A or AA rating, and so that depends on our attractiveness um, across the industry. Okay. And if we're suitable for specific uh, biomass um, developers, whether it be the hydrogen fuel, biochar, mm -hmm. um, other byproducts of that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we are not committing any uh, staff time in particular other than supporting and assisting in the process. Councilman Goodson. So I understand <coughs> what Councilwoman um, Riggs is asking. And I believe in order to even start this, um, just the basics, in order to determine whether our com community is a potential candidate um, and, and a good designation, we would have had to consider some basic questions. Um, do we have over 100,000 tons per year of available surplus or unused biomass? And do we have su suppliers that are willing to supply it to a new market and that can pay fair market value? Um, and also a third question would be, um, does the city of Oroville have a good enough infrastructure base to support an operating plant? Uh, and then I'm just curious about what are the employment opportunities? I think that's what this is all about, is determining that. So, well, but and I can we, assist with answering that question. We had to make a basic synopsis and a, a review to even consider ourselves a potential candidate. Absolutely. So Mr. Irvin and I are part of the biomass task force that is made up of Butte County, um, Audrey Taylor, and the Fire Safe Council. The Fire Safe Council has conducted a survey of what our inventory is of biomass between the burn scar areas, the old growth, and the um, woody um, uh, orchard waste. So we have a substantial amount of woody material and biomass available to support biomass developments, because that was specifically one of my questions. How many biomass developments can we occupy here in our industrial area before we have oversaturated ourselves and we've created another boom and bust scenario? So they specifically um, research that, and we do have an opportunity, depending on what each of those developments would have to use and produce their biomass, um, whatever their biomass out product would be, mm -hmm. and um, we are still in good standing. So once Yosemite Clean comes in, it just depends on what their quantities um, for consumption would be, but then, <clears throat> we would just review each other, each application following that to see where we stand within those um, ratings in the remaining wood waste. But we still have substantial material. So Don, I, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. I think that we all received the communication from a particular community mm -hmm. member where this has been an ongoing concern. I know that several years ago, um, we had a lot of pushback from the community uh, and so, can you, can you speak to those concerns? Uh, for those concerns, it depends specifically on what each biomass development that would come to us would be producing and what their process would be. So it would go through the city's review process. There's the Butte County Air Quality Control Board that it would have to be reviewed through. There's the Envir um, California Environmental Quality Act or the CEQA. Um, so an environmental impact report would have to be reviewed for each project that comes to our um, city for review. So it just depends on what that would be for us to determine what the outcome would be, whether it be detrimental to health and safety or whether it be a clean process. Okay. It's situational. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Smith. Yeah, I, I fully support sustainable, renewable approaches to renewables as biomass. Mm -hmm. I think uh, it's just great opportunity. In Orville, we need to seize the op this moment to get out in front. Um, and then, of course, our, as you've already pointed out, CEQA, uh, Air Quality Management Board, there's many layers in California in particular Absolutely. that actually make it sometimes 
difficult for mm -hmm. these emerging industries to come here and to, you know, make a profit and provide a quality product. And so I'm, I, I'm in full. So I think it's great. I think it's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. We should uh, seize the moment. The only question I have in my mind, which went to your statement about boom or busted, as we all know, I mean, there's a massive amount of uh, fuel because of the fires. And, uh, and to that, uh, so back to the sustainability piece, mm -hmm. I would be concerned if the, you know companies opened up, right, took all that material, mm -hmm. and then, you know, after, and I don't know how long that material, how long is it, uh, five years, four years, because we know that eventually that those, you Decades. know, it's going to rot, and, and you can't do anything yeah. with it. But uh, I don't know what that looks like. I have no, I mean, it's not my expertise. But that would be the only, in the back of my mind, concern, uh, other than, obviously, air quality and all of that pollution. I mean, mm -hmm. sure, but I mean, we're going to rely heavily on those agencies, state agencies, to ensure that we're not taken advantage of or abused, that this is a, a quality piece that brings you know, jobs and, and all of that to Orville Absolutely. and more. Mm -hmm. but, uh, but that's just in, in the back of my mind. You know, what does that look like? Mm -hmm. And we'll make sure that, that doesn't happen, that we don't get used and abused and left. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. This uh, biomass task force that Don mentioned, uh, which is, it includes all the jurisdictions in the county, um, ha has a survey out right now. They're trying to identify uh, who uses biomass, how they use it, uh, where it goes, where it comes from. Uh, they have another study as to quantifying the, the uh, biomass, and, and, and it's a lot, as one might imagine. Um, and then uh, this study, including the, the lead up to creating the zone, if it gets created, uh, the infrastructure base will be looking at that in great detail. Uh, Oroville is, is, is really in good shape in terms of its industrial land, in terms of the past uh, lo uh, logging mills and, and sawmills and things that have been here. So we've had a, a huge wood products industry in the past, and, and this may in fact be some some um, revitalization of a wood wood processing industry that would help Oroville. Uh, and then the employment opportunities uh, situational by uh, individual project, uh, but the uh, average job generation per plant in these other BDOs is about 231 per, per plant. So uh, they can, it can be quite significant. Councilperson Riggs. Thank okay. you. So I just want to reiterate and make sure that I have this completely accurate before voting and that the public has this accurate as well. That if the grant goes through, it's examining whether or not it's a feasible practice within our community. And then if it is grant, you know, if it is feasible here, then it'll come back to city council to change land use, right, to a BDO. Is that correct? It would I'm be assuming, an overlay. Yeah. The so existing it would land be use voted on again hmm. in, in well, some capacity by the council? Yes. Okay. Right. And then each business would be under the same scrutiny and review and as all new businesses, which will include an environmental study. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. right. Councilperson Goodson. Yes, when this does come back before the city council, will this be under a public hearing? That uh, presumably it will. If we do create an overlay zone, uh, it would go before the planning commission and then before the city council. Uh, and uh, going back 30 years ago to when the enterprise zones were all created, those would have come before the city council. Uh, recycle market development zones, uh, those would come before the city council to have their geographies determined and everything else. Sorry. Good, because it's important for the, um, I know that there's people in the community that would like to respond and, and have a buy-in. Okay. Thank you. And I know that, the, sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. Right, thanks. I know that this is a shot in the dark question, but um, when would you expect that to come back to the city? Three years, five years, two years? What's our time frame? Probably two years. Two years, yeah. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, before you get down, do we have any uh, comments from the public, either online or in the, or in the room? 
Mr. Mayor, I do have one blue speaker card for Brian Wong. If okay. anyone online would like to speak on this, please use the raise your hand feature. So Brian Wong. Mr. Wong. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and City Council. Uh, so for uh, most of you, you know that I'm a local entrepreneur. I work on restaurants and buildings, but actually uh, on my uh, spare time, I've been working on uh, the biomass issues for about a year and a half now. So anyway, I am speaking in support of it because uh, there's a lot of solutions that we need in this area. So if you look at how Orville is situated, we're actually you know, right at the intersection of agriculture and the Sierra Nevada mountains. So we're at the center of all these this biomass issues. And if you see it as a problem, we can also turn it into solutions. So just to give everybody uh, an understanding of the scale of the problems we're dealing with. Um, so when people farm rice for every acre, the, the amount of straws that we have left is about right. three tons. So when we're fully planted, uh, if you have like 550,000 acres that we can have in the area, that's over a million like uh, tons of uh, biomass each year. Mm -hmm. So in the past, they were allowed to burn and after that, you know, they said, hey, we can't allow you guys to burn anymore because that's a lot of pollutants in the air. So then they started flooding it in the fields. Well, in drought years, what do you do? So there's no solutions for the farmers. Um, so same thing with our forests. You know, we got to be able to pay forest contractors a certain amount of money to take all the residues off from the forests to keep everything safe. So currently, a lot of people say that about $55 is the magic number. So if you have plants that can, you know, pay people $55 per ton to take in, you can actually hire employees from the area to go and harvest those residues that needs to be cleaned from the forest and take it in. So people have agreed that, okay, that's the number that, that people need to have a viable business in cleaning up our forest. So all the solutions are there. Um, the huge problem is when we took out Popeyes a few years ago, uh, we don't have any solutions in the area. So if you have extra biomass that you want to get rid of, well, you got to truck it all the way up to Anderson, to that cogent plant. Well, that's a long drive, lots of labor, lots of fuel. So what are we doing in the meantime by doing that? Well, we're polluting the air by driving more and spending more money. Mm -hmm. So when we look at like biomass, especially in our city, we've got to look at it carefully because this is our opportunity. The state is going to carbon sequestration, and one of the ways to do it is to convert uh, biomass to biochar and other materials such as graphene. So the state of New Jersey just uh, might have been a week ago, they've already mandated that in the future, all this, uh, the civil projects, buildings, and parking lots that use concrete, they're going to be putting biochar into the concrete to strengthen it. So that's one carbon sequestration. Time. Thank you. Thank yes. you, Mr. Wong. Appreciate that. Appreciate your words. Thank you. Anyone else at the council? I, I do have a follow-up question with uh, Mr. Wong, just real quick. Okay, please. So, and the rules do allow for us to do that. No. Oh, yeah. Just, uh, I, I think air quality is something that enters our mind, and you just touched on something that was, I think, real significant to this, and that is that not all biochar is burned as a pollutant. It goes into other products. So maybe just for a moment, expand on that. Uh, yes. Yeah. So uh, the uh, the old technology and how we used to handle biomass was we used to burn it. So that's called a cogen plant. Mm -hmm. You burn it for heat or power. So today the technology is called pyrolysis. And you're just heating it up slowly, but you're not burning anything. It's in the absence of uh, oxygen, so it doesn't burn. So what you do is you use technology to combine all those gases or the solids into what you want. Okay. So it's, it's pyrolysis is way different than uh, mm. you know, uh, incineration. Mm. Okay. And all those technologies today, they exist. Yeah, thank you. And I think that's some of the thank concerns you. that the public has. And so that's Absolutely. great. So we really appreciate that right. explanation. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I'll make a final comment, too. I think we've already got a biomass facility here. It's called Sierra Pacific Sawmill. Mm. And every bit of their bark uh, is chipped up and utilized and sold as bark chips. So we already have the business going on here. And Orville at one time had seven operating sawmills cutting mm -hmm. raw logs back in the day. So this is a, an opportunity for the, the community to do it right and do it properly and uh, take this designation and run with it. So I think it's a great right. idea. 
Um, seeing no other further uh, comments, what would you like to do with your item number six? I move that we approve you the attached it. letter <laughs> supporting a grant application right. um, by the Butte County Fire Council. It's been yeah. moved. I hear a second. I'll second. All right. Moved and seconded. Call the roll, please. Councilmember Thompson, how do you vote? Yes. Motion carries with seven yeses and zero noes. Appreciate that. Uh, next item, regular business. Uh, item number eight, approve the lease and sublease with the Orville Rescue Mission for Mission, Mission Esperanza. I approve. Attorney? <laughs> It's, might it's provide an explanation deal. to the public. This, I was going to say, this might be the shortest uh, speech <laughs> I've ever given. Uh, I will try and fill the shoes of Amy Bergstrand. Those are big shoes to fill. But um, this is, we've had this discussion before in, in several different forums with the council. But Mission Esperanza is a, a close to a two acre property. Um, the city, several years ago, um, passed a, a resolution declaring a shelter crisis. And um, the city applied for a grant, received. Uh, several million dollars from the state. Mr. Huber, if I could. Um, Council oh, Member sorry. Weber, I'm going to have to oh. ask you or yeah. to recuse yeah. yourself from this item because of a personal financial interest. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Start over. That's, <laughs> that's why I wasn't on consent was so we could do that yeah. and I completely forgot. Um, so the, the, uh, the, the city applied for a, mul a multi-million dollar grant. It was close to three million, just shy of three million dollars. If I remember correctly, and we were awarded that grant to to per, to to fund this project. Mm -hmm. Mission Esperanza will um, will house uh, thirty uh, pallet shelters, and um, and the funding incorporates all of the uh, ancillary costs that go along with that. Now, th there is something, and again, I'm I'm going to cut right to the chase because I know we've talked about this a lot. Um, one of the requirements is that the city owner control the property where where these pallet shelters are located. Well, we don't own the Mission Esperanza property, so we are entering into a lease of the property and then we're subleasing it right back to them. That puts us in control of the property and does follow along with the guidelines. Having said that, and I mentioned this uh, in, in some other forums, but th there are a couple of issues with pallet shelters. Number one, they don't comply with current zoning. The, the exception in the government code for public agencies to do this is related to the housing shelter. So, or the, 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 the resolution that was passed on the housing uh, shelter crisis or shortage. So what happens is at the end of this three years, th there would be no way for this project to then comply with zoning. There's also no way for this project ever to comply with building codes. Pallet shelters don't have foundations. They don't have you know, plumbing. They don't have, and I know there's some other things that, that could apply to make it exempt, but generally speaking, they just don't, they don't comply with the building, building codes. This procedure is an exception carved out in the government code for public agencies to utilize. Um, this is somewhat of a pilot program from the state. There, there were, I think, four public agencies uh, that were given funds in this round of funding. The agreement that we have, and I, I will use, if I can use a, a basketball term, there is a shot clock, a three-year shot clock that, that, is, that we know about that, that, that will go off. At the end of three years, if we don't find more funding to be able to keep this procedure going, this process going, then these palace shelters will need to be disassembled and, and taken right. down and and. and and their use would need to cease at that time. Having said that, during the three years, we, in conjunction with Mission Esperanza, we meaning staff from the city, will be looking for additional funding measures to keep this going beyond the three years. The hope is that we can help transition individuals into the, into the palace shelters, provide them services and support that they need, and get them out into homes, into apartments, into full-time jobs, in into all the things that, that make the society great, which will create room for other individuals to then backfill. Um, and and uh, again, it is a, it is a uh, there's a three-year timeline. We have a three-year contract on this. The hope is that we will be able to extend it, um, but that's not guaranteed. Um, there are some guarantees in here though. For example, for, from an insurance standpoint, 
we do require insurance because we're now in the chain of title. The city is leasing the property. We're leasing it back. There is insurance to, to cover any potential liability. So the city is covered from a liability standpoint. Okay. Um, we've tried to dot every I and cross every T that we could think of. Uh, I'm sure there's something we haven't thought of that will come up at, at this at this brand new facility once it starts you know running. We have the... Uh, the commitment of the Mission Esperanza group um, and the Hope Center to, um, you know, to work on these issues as they come up. Um, they will, you know, again, no, no doubt, no doubt we'll have to, you know, cross some of these bridges when they come. But at this point, you know, it looks like a, a good project and, and staff can stand behind it and support it. Councilman Goodson. Yes, I just, mm -hmm. and I mean, I know, I believe I know this, but I don't make any assumptions. So this is not a partnership. We're not a part of the administrative staff. We are not a Q&A, a sounding board, et cetera. We are only um, entering into a lease agreement for three years, period. Uh, yes, with the exception of we, no. are the, we are the conduit for funding f through the state. So the state, All right. we, we, we applied, we applied on behalf of, sort of on behalf of Mission Esperanza for this funding to come in, and we're now passing it off to them. The state has a requirement that we be in the chain of title. We either need to own or control the property, which is where the lease comes in. We are not, we are not going to be administratively dealing with individuals there. We're not going to be running any programs. We're not going to be doing it. That's Mission Esperanza's job, which is what the funding is there for. The funding is paying for indivi some individuals to, to work in those jobs. And I, I'm sure some will be volunteers, some will be paid. But, but that's, that's what that funding is for. There so we're be... just the receptacle that holds the funding like for Oroville Hospital. The, the Oroville Hospital is a perfect example. Yep, we are, we are just the pipeline through which the money flows. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just like a sprinkler system, right? The water flows through the pipe. Okay. We, the, the money flows right through the city to this group. Um, and, and, and again, we have, we have taken every, um, you know, we've taken every, um, precaution. precaution that we can think of to try to make sure that, that the city is protected and, and we will also, we have committed, again, we hope this is wildly successful. We hope that we can find continued funding for it so it can mm. continue beyond the three years. And again, assuming that it's wildly successful, there ought to be f funding available. Mm -hmm. And so um, we'll look at it when the time comes. But again, I do want to be clear. If at the end of three years, mm -hmm. and this is in the agreement, okay. if there isn't additional funding, then it then, has to be dismantled. Then these will have to be dismantled because then they won't comply with the zoning code mm -hmm. or the, predominantly the building code. With the zoning code, we could always issue like a variance or some sort of a use, or use permit or some sort of an exception mm -hmm. to the zoning. It's the building code that really is a stickler. And, and those are kind of hard and fast rules, and we don't get to just change them. But, yeah. but the state does get to, mm -hmm. and they've made, they've made this opportunity available. So, right. Thank you. Vice Mayor Smith, please. Yeah, thank you. You know, the state, along with Continuum of Care, had a mission. It was a 10-year mission. I think we're in year eight through rapid rehousing programs and the like to end homelessness. So we only need two more years, and we'll get it done. So we got a year buffer because we got three. Well, uh, yeah, you yeah know, I'm the, being, of course, yeah, okay. tongue in cheek with that. Um, with the pallet shelters, that's a part of this, but there's also other components to right. allowing people to uh, uh, have safe space, if you will. So could those other components, let's say we hit year three, we don't have the funding to continue on, uh, worst case scenario, as you've described, would those other components be, could we make those other components still available? Um, could we? The answer is yes, we could. Okay. Um, that would be up to the council at that time. If there is no other funding available, you know, you'd, you'd have a determination to make. Mission Esperanza could also seek donations and make them available without city council help. Right. I mean, there, there's, there's, there are lots of alternatives there. Mm -hmm. Having said that, the, benef the, the beneficial items of this program, I'm sure, will be able to continue. And those that don't work or don't work as successfully as we had hoped will be able to be modified or eliminated. Very good. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat>
Well, I want to thank our city attorney for finding this particular clause in this process because no one knew this was about there. And, and um, our due diligence by our, our city and staff has been very helpful to make sure this all works. So, and we're very appreciative of Mission Esperanza and the rescue mission to step up to this situation. So, um, do we have any other speakers on this item? You might want to recognize Annie and uh, Alan. Mr. Mayor, I do not have any public speakers on this item. If there's anyone on Zoom that would like to speak, please use the raise your hand feature. And I'm not seeing anyone online that would like to speak either. Okay. Annie or Alan, would you like to speak on anything? <laughs> they think it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Here he comes. Yeah. Here he goes. All right, All right Alan. Mr. Mayor, Council, yes, um, we are definitely um, all for this. Um, we're excited because we're seeing a lot of things happening. Um, it's given us a lot of different opportunities to be able to help the homeless, but also too, um, it's gonna help the community. It's, it's, it's improving our quality of life for our citizens. Um, this here, we've, we've got some other plans set up where we are definitely seeking more and more um, finances as we go. Um, part of the project is, is that we are the warehouse is being turned into a dormitory that is going to be up to city code that does have to go through the planning commission and those different things. So I believe that is one aspect that will be already in place so that the project won't completely go away after three years if we can't get the, if we can't maintain the funding for the pallet shelters. Thank you, sir, for that update. Yep. Very informative. And, and Mr. Mayor, I need to correct one thing that I did that I said. I, I said it was the Hope Center. That was running. It's the yeah. Orville Rescue Mission. Yeah. My apologies. That's all right. I, I, we got you. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> all right. With that, any further discussion? I'd entertain a motion. So move. I second that. Call roll, please. Councilmember Thompson, how do you vote? Yes. Motion carries with six yeses and one recused. Okay. Item number nine. Uh, is up uh, employment agreement between the city of Orville and Brian Ring. Can we do this? Good evening, Mr. Mayor and Council. What you have before you tonight is the consideration of an employment agreement with Mr. Brian Ring to uh, fill the capacity as the city administrator for the city of Orville. Uh, in December, late December, we began our search for a, a city administrator. There were two local candidates that were identified. Both of those candidates were interviewed. Uh, Mr. Ring was selected from that interview process. Um, after that, we completed the hiring process and labor negotiation with Mr. Ring for the contract. This is a three-year contract. It will begin on February 27th and will run through of 2023 and will be effective through February 26th of 26 of 2026 at that time if Mr. Ring so chooses to continue he can ask for a two-year uh, extension if the council is agreeable that extension will be granted um, all the terms and conditions of the contract are listed within the contract that is attached to this report the funding for this position is already contained in the fiscal year 22-23 budget um, with that I'm willing to answer any questions that you may have uh, I guess I should probably just cover that Mr. Ring has been working in the Butte County area for many years. He has served the county for 13 years in the capacity as a assistant um, county chief, chief administrative officer, also as a deputy administrative officer. He has a four-year degree and a, an advanced degree, a master's degree in business administration. He has um, a, a plethora of experience and a wealth of knowledge that he'll bring to the city and I believe will be able to take us to our, our next progression uh, or our next level, I mean, to improve our services and improve our community. With that, I can answer any questions. Mr. Ring is here also tonight that would be willing to, I'm sure he's willing to come up and answer any questions that you may have. I think an introduction would be nice. All right. <clears throat> Should I start with ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls? <laughs> <laughs> So this is uh, council. I mean, I believe you've all met Mr. Brian Ring, and with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. He can speak better about himself than I can, I believe. <laughs> Thanks, Bill. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, all. Just uh, 
want to thank you all for this opportunity. I'm truly excited. I cannot uh, wait to get started and, and really get to know each and every one of you, work with all of you, understand your priorities and where you want to see, say, see the uh, city of Orville go in the future. I'm really looking forward to working with all the great staff as well. So I just, again, thank you very much for the opportunity. All right. Very good. All thank, right. you. thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Oh. I would entertain a motion. So, Mr. Move. Mayor. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, roll, we please. do have a public speaker oh, on this item. Yeah. Uh, Garrett Sholin. All right. All right. You guys are ready to vote. I don't need to. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, uh, Garrett Sholin, unit chief for Cal Fire, and has also served as your uh, fire chief here for the city. So um, wanted to say a couple things about Mr. Ring. I've had the opportunity to know him and work with him over the course of his time with the county. Mostly it started with the emergency management side of things, as you know, the biggest disasters in the state have been here in Butte County. And so my relationship with him in that emergency management role, I've seen him work under pressure and he's developed great relationships with people, have brought folks together that otherwise wouldn't talk to each other into a room to a common goal and get to the scenarios and things that we needed to address. I've also worked with him in the county administration uh, and those uh, as a very difficult position as a department head over with the county on that side and them. So he's not afraid to ask the difficult questions. Uh, and if he doesn't know what the issue is, he will take the time to seek um, an understanding of the issue before he makes a decision. And lastly, I do know him as a community member. So as, if there is any prerequisite for this position or any department head position, it really is <laughs> the president of the volunteer uh, or volunteer for the president of the Little League in the community. <laughs> if, he can, if he can make it through all those parents and that, I think he's, he's well qualified. So. Uh, uh, you know, based on your decision here this evening, uh, I look forward to working with uh, Mr. Ring in the fire rescue part of the city. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. <laughs> Any other comments? If anyone on Zoom would like to speak, please raise your hand. Mr. Mayor, I do not see any other public speakers on this item. Okay. I'd and I motion. do have a first and a second. Um, oh, I have Riggs a as a first and oh. meeting to vote. All right. Goodson. Well, then let's call the roll. <laughs> Councilmember Thompson, how do you vote? A resounding yes. <laughs> the motion right. carries with seven yeses and zero noes. Welcome. Uh, yes. Welcome. <laughs> All right. Uh, item number 10, council appointment to committees, commissions, and boards. Um, let me see if I can. I appreciate all the councilman uh, input for these committee assignments and appointments. Um, we've had a good round of discussions on that, and uh, this is the best uh, list I've got here, so I'd entertain a motion to accept these appointments uh, and uh, entertain any questions anyone has. So moved. I have a comment. Go ahead. Mr. Thompson. Thank you. So I've um, been on the council now for six years, duly elected by the citizens as a voice of the citizens. And as you know, Mr. Mayor, uh -huh. in November of last year, I did request to speak and the last I heard was you get back to me. Um, so it, I, I'm not really into petty politics or holding up the system, but I'm definitely in favor of representing the people's voice. So I have reached out to have a discussion. That means I've yet to hear back. So I actually request that we postpone this until a special meeting for next week. And we can be there when I can be there. So you're asking to table it until you can be here to vote? Is that my understanding? Yes, also, also, also to give a couple more days, I guess, for I'm not sure. I, I don't want to presuppose or assume motive for not getting back but uh, at least a couple more days so um you know it's i think it's standard process procedure um at least has been last six years as i've been here for the mayor to even issue an email out to everybody or a piece of paper that says interest or whatnot for committees that hasn't been done i'm not sure what communications you have had with other council meeting council members but few more days for a discussion would be great. At least uh, five minutes of input would be wonderful. Um, so yeah, for a little bit of time for discussion and also to uh, to be there in person. 
my only exception is if, if that's not um the, i know the ones that are really pressing are bcag um and those are pretty standard to have the mayor and vice mayor so i would even be mentioned be willing to have those two um Butte county air quality and Butte county government for those just to be moved forward and the rest of them to be tabled until wednesday i just went up a flight of stairs so i'm a little bit short of breath <laughs> All right, thank you. Uh, Council Member Weber. Yeah, I would second. Are you suggesting a special meeting or the next regular meeting that we have? I'm requesting a, a special meeting. As I stated at the beginning of the year, the 21st, I'll be in the deep mountains of Idaho with no cell reception. That would be the 15th of February. Wednesday. Next Wednesday would be the 15th. I believe that's what he said is Wednesday of next week. Okay. I'm pretty flexible. Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, Wednesday. Um, Wednesday I know it would definitely work, but. Councilman Riggs. Uh, yeah. it's, it's still early. Can we sort out? these details now or is it better for you to do that in person that I understand that that is but I think that if there's just a few adjustments we can make then so be it well I'll, I'll explain that I, I when we started in January I put out a posting and I allowed all the councilmen to please let me know what your feelings are your ability to make the committees and so on and so forth and then I had some suggestions and we at the next meeting there were some suggestions from the council that didn't care for a couple of new ideas so i removed those ideas so we've had an ongoing discussion about this at all times and and i've had many emails and text messages from the rest of the council uh on top of this um if the council wants to have a special meeting so be it but uh i i certainly would entertain your discussions and um, i've tried to not have it as public discussions uh so it uh, if the if the body wants to vote on that that's fine mr weber go ahead yes thank you so uh you i have received one email from you mm -hmm. uh regarding the uh, committee appointments no <laughs> other communication um, i do agree with uh, councilman uh, thompson that that i have reached out to you several times too and have not gotten any uh reciprocal communication so as far as uh, an open dialogue regarding these committee appointments, we have not had none. Um, so I think that it would be uh, prudent for us to put this off until uh, Councilman Thompson's back. And the reason why is because as I look at this committee appointment chart, this looks like a very unfair and unequitable appointment. And um, I'll say this. You know, we've heard it before at this dais that if one boat floats, they all float. I think we need to be fair, equitable, and manage this in a way that we all can look at the appointments and see if it fits our schedules and how we can all work around these things. What's the wishes of the council? Are we please? We have a motion and a second. And by the way, I, I uh, I, I'm not sure where you posted that, Mr. Mayor, and regarding uh, fishing for input from council members, but I I, uh, I can go back through my emails, but I don't know where that was posted or issued, but I definitely didn't ever see that. Uh, it was very simply added to the agenda of the January meeting, and the, I gave these out, and I asked for council input at the January meeting, very simply. And I did receive input. The city administrator put out a request for any input from any council members. Mm -hmm. And the city administrator received input and they transferred and we made adjustments. Mr. Mayor, I do have one public speaker on this item. Yeah, please. Bill Spear. Vice Mayor, City Council. Um, I agree with uh, Councilman Thompson about um, uh, wanting to get past um, the petty politics things and 
be fair and equitable. And for, to me, it, it does seem like um, there is some petty stuff in here, which, you know, it shouldn't be really an issue. And, and it doesn't seem very fair. There's one council member in here that has, uh, is on two um, committees and other ones are on six. Uh, that's uh, not a very fair way of dividing up the work. Um, when I spoke last time on this, this issue came up, I am a downtown business owner and I'm on the uh, downtown business uh, district board and I spoke about um, that you had put uh, Councilwoman Riggs on that committee instead of, of Councilman Weber. As a downtown uh, business owner, I would like our representative for that won the election. I, I realize that you won the, the election and congratulations, but he also won for the, for the downtown. And it's, it doesn't seem that very complicated that the, the downtown representative for that district should be on that, on that council. You could have Councilwoman Riggs as the alternate. It's not uh, something that, you know, I think should be any contention. He's our representative. He should be on this committee, just as Councilwoman um, Johnstone is at the airports in her district. And, and as we're moving into this districting, which I didn't agree with, none of us did, but we are there. And so we should honor that. And I don't know why, uh, you, you know, you said last time, first come, first serve. I don't think that's a very, um, a very good policy of how to to fill districts. You should put the right person in the right committees, like uh, Councilman Thompson was talking about, uh, seeing what conflicts with their schedule and putting a little more energy and effort into it. Also, the executive committee and the intergovernmental committee. Um, Councilman Smith is is our vice mayor, and maybe it's just me. I think the vice mayor should. That's a, a, a committee that, that he should be on. Um, and, you know, you, you should honor the position. You, you are mayor, but he is also the vice mayor. And that is a council, that is a committee that, that he should be on. Council Member Weber should be on the downtown one. Uh, Time. Councilman Smith should be on. Thank you for your comments. Councilman Riggs? Yeah, I just wanted to respond um, to Mr. Spears' uh, comments regarding me and my appointment to the Downtown Business Association. I've been an advocate for the Business Association and helped start the Business Improvement District. Um, many years of service to the Downtown District, and no matter what my appointment is, that will remain. I will share, though, that I did speak to the officers of the Downtown Board, and they felt that at this time, because of turnover within their board, the continuity of having a sustained and experienced council member who very much understands their unique difficulties and priorities would be more beneficial um, at this time. However, in the near future, you know, this comes up every year that they're absolutely open to that change. And I absolutely agree that Mr. Weber would be a good representative for the Downtown Business Association. Um, and that that's something that even in this coming year we could, we could share and I could help get him up to speed on all the things within that district. So I just want to share that uh, I did speak to the officers of the Business Improvement District and, it was, and took that into consideration when voicing um, my preferences for committees. So thank you. Uh, Vice Mayor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just to add my observations, um, and comments to this. Uh, I'm basically in agreement with uh, Councilman Thompson's suggestion um, with the BCAG and Butte Air Quality Control Board. I think that's a motion. I think there was a second on that. Uh, and then just to the equitable um, point, uh, and I think this is just also a good opportunity for the public to understand, the lion's share of all of these committees and appointments uh, are volunteer hours that each of these uh, each of us serve and we're happy to do so but we're also in different stages of our life with uh, our personal employment um, 
you know, uh, our commitments to family. And I think to that end, I, I think I might be hearing that there may be some uh, issues there, per perhaps. Uh, so I think that there might be some interest in further dialogue. And then one other point is that of all of these uh, volunteer hours, now, just to digress for a moment, for me personally, I can serve on uh, two thirds of these in part because of my job. I'm already there, whether or not you're there or not. But I think that in the sense of fairness and interest to the balance of the council, I just, you know, I let our, our mayor know that I don't need to be appointed to those things. I'm there anyway. Uh, um, and I just to the point of the ODBA with uh, Councilwoman Riggs and uh, and Councilman Weber's being uh, District F. I think they both bring quality uh, representation to the downtown. But I think that's fair to also you know have that perhaps that discussion. And then just one one additional observation. <laughs> that was <laughs> one additional observation uh, to that, and that is that of all of these appointments. Uh, and, and service time that's just rendered uh, volunteer, the countless volunteer hours. And, and I know that everyone works hard at that. There is one um, um, uh, committee that does pay substantially, uh, and it actually it's always concerned me, and I think it's uh, the, the SCORE, which is the sewerage uh, uh, committee that deals with, of all things, sewer. Uh, and not a very glamorous committee. Maybe that's why it pays $593 a month. Uh, and I think it's a one meeting. And I think so to the tune of equitableness, I know that uh, Councilwoman, I believe Councilwoman Goodson and the mayor have served on those committees before. And I'm just, I know that uh, Councilman Thompson is currently on score. So there may be some interest in having that dialogue. I'm just, you know, kind of presenting here, uh, you know, uh, speaking out loud, kind of what I'm reading between sure. the lines. And so it might behoove us to go ahead and have that kind of maybe challenged conversation of working through this and have a special meeting and allowing uh, Councilman Thompson to have his opportunity to uh, personally express you know, where he's coming from with this. And there may be others that have a, a additional expression as well. But, uh, you know, when I look at, again, how this is divvied up, mm. you know, when you are being paid pretty handsomely for showing up for, and I don't know how long score meetings are, I assume a few hours. Mm. I don't know how long you can go on and talk about sewer. But, <laughs> but, but it, it, it can be complex, and it is a very important uh, to our city, to EDUs, where there's a lot of very important issues to infrastructure moving forward so we can continue to develop our community. I mean, it's an important commission. I don't want to, you know, sound like I'm kind of poo-pooing it. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> but, but anyway, I think I've, I've said enough. Um, but um, I think certainly endorse uh, what uh, Councilman Thompson's putting forth. You know, one of the things you haven't asked me about that I, if I did my homework, and I did my homework <laughs> with every one of the committees, Every one of these assignments, I followed up to find out what they need, uh, the DBA and the other associations. I don't want to bring what I found in homework out to public discussion, because my job is to make this council look positive. And there may be some negatives, and I don't choose to bring that out to this council. That's why these appointments are where they are. I made choices based upon the information I received. I also making choices on the 2,226 people who voted for me. And as far as score goes, you go back 20 years, the mayor has always served on score. It's been that way forever. And um, we can openly discuss them, but I warn you, I warn you, we will end up in being a negative council experience because it's my job to fit everyone to the best ability I have to find out where they're going to fit. And as you bring up one mention about Mr. Weber, he is an alternate to the Downtown Business Association. You know, that's, that's what, on here on this list. You may not have a current list, but this is their current list of today. So uh, instead of having a public forum to debate this, I'm going to table this item to our next regular meeting. And in the meantime, we'll all have those discussions between me and the council members. They're wide open and we'll, we'll, I welcome that discussion. I've had that discussion in, in, in emails and in uh, text messages and the city administrator received the information and we passed it along. In some of the cases, I believe I've met all the requests of council members and some I've met a request where 
they didn't want to serve on that. That's fine. I've done that. I've already done that. So the, to paint the picture that I haven't done my work, I'll, I'll tell you I've done my homework. And I do my homework. And anybody that knows me knows that I'll do the homework. So it's my job to make sure this council looks very positive and no negatives. And that's why we are where we are. So at this item, I would like to table this issue until our re next regular meeting because I think having a special meeting it doesn't serve well to the city. M Mr. Mayor, the issue that we have is that there has been two motions made and two seconds have been brought forward. So we have to deal with those motions. Okay. Uh, we have a couple speakers, Ms. Councilman Riggs. Thanks. I just wanted to clarify and make sure that I had this right. If somebody has feedback about their council appointments, they shall contact Mr. Legrone or Mayor can, Pittman by email. You can lose, use Legrone as a pastor to me. He, he uh, report, report, reports it direct to me or you can give it direct to me. Okay. That's, that's the job I'm supposed to be doing here. Thank you. Um, who else was up? Wasn't there somebody else? Everybody. Okay. All right. Mr. Mayor, if I could just, I'll have uh, Ms. Uh, Glover repeat so what those motions are our, so see if somebody wants to right. withdraw that. Our yeah. first motion was uh, made by Councilmember Goodson and second by Councilmember Riggs to approve the assignments as presented by the mayor. And then the second motion was made by Councilmember Thompson and seconded by Councilmember Weber to postpone to a special meeting to be had next week. Is that... Did he, you need to ask him because I think he said two could go forward under that, uh, under that motion. Just double check. He I'm fine with the make it recommending the motion. Can you I, hear me? I'm not asking you to do that. I just, I wasn't his, sure. This was uh, no, his original no, I'll motion. Clarify. He did say that he, that if it was the pleasure of the council, we could vote on those two committees, but that wasn't part of the motion originally. I will, I will amend the motion to include approving BCAG, both Air Quality and Butte County Association of Government, to those to vote separately, but the rest of them to table to a special meeting for next Wednesday. I'll second that. Under the question? The question. Is the, yeah, and I'll, I'll say this, the, I, th I believe the city charter Besides the role of, of de facto parliamentarian to the, <laughs> to the city attorney. So, Mr. Mayor, what was your question? The question about the appointments being made by the mayor, if they're approving one or two, or do they include the entire whole? So they can. This is, it, it, there's, a, there's a memo and a policy written about this a long time ago, and I'll just very briefly summarize it. This is similar to, um, and again, all politics aside, this is similar to the president assigning the cabinet members and the Senate approving them. They get a thumbs up or a thumbs down, but they don't get to substitute. Right. So if the motion was to uh, to um, postpone I'm most sorry. but approve two of them, that is within the purview okay. of the council to approve two of them now, mm -hmm. if that's how they want to do it. They can take their pick. What they cannot do is substitute the will of of some, someone can't make a motion say, well, I want to substitute this person and that person gotcha. in these positions. Thank you, for, thank you for the clarification. Yep. All right, move forward. I guess we're ready for roll call. So the motion that you're voting on now is to postpone um, all of the committees except for BCAG and air quality control to a special meeting for next week. BCAG and air quality control will be voted on as it approved by the committee appointments that the mayor has presented. Yeah, and, and just again, to explain to the public, Rosenberg's Rules of Order, which has been adopted by the council, there can be up to three motions on the table at one time as long as they all have seconds. The last motion made is the first one voted on, and you go in reverse order on voting on the motion. So the second motion, since there are two motions on the table, the second motion will go first, and if that does not pass, then the first motion will be voted on. If the second motion that you're voting on first passes, it moots the first motion. Got it. Everyone understand that? Yes, and I would like to make a motion that we um, approve BCAG and Butte County Air Quality Control at this time and continue the discussion at our next regularly scheduled meeting, which is February the 2nd. 21. 21. Thank you. Is there a second for that motion? With private conversations occurring within. I'll second it. Okay. So that's the third motion on the table. So that motion will be voted on first. Um, okay. Yep. And, and So the motion at hand is Butte 
quality or BCAG and air quality control vote for now, and the rest would be at our next regularly scheduled meeting. Postpone to the 21st. Yes. Councilmember Thompson, how do you vote? I, oh, can oh, I, can I comment? Can I just? Sure, I'm going to question. Okay, just to be it clear that I think uh, Councilman Thompson is out of town on that. They know. Get the regular scheduled meeting, so he would not be able to participate they, in well, that assuming conversation. Assuming you would be able to have a discussion in advance. So I'm just pointing that out. Okay. Council Member Thompson, how do you vote? Uh, first, before I vote, I just want to clarify. Uh, number one, I have not received any communication from our city administrator asking input on council assignments. Number two, uh, had the mayor given another avenue for input, that would have been great. The input I was given was, I will get back to you. That has not done. So I assume that's also part of homework to follow up on your word, which hasn't happened. So on this motion, my vote is no. And let me clarify something, sir. That request you made was a social invent invitation between your wife and myself and my spouse. That was not a council business activity. And you have the email. Every city councilman has email and received the same email. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll clarify as well. So yes, it, the conversation was a reach out. Number one, it was congratulation right after your confirmation. Right. So I'm, I'm definitely in favor of a council that works together with mutual respect. It was also a follow-up to reach out to communicate. And as a point of gesture and friendliness, uh, also there was a, uh, a yes, a clarification for us to get together with our wives, a relationship building exercise. So those are one and two. They were not one and the same. Um, so if that was what your, um, if that is what your thoughts were, maybe they would have been clarified at our last meeting when I communicated that I wanted to get together and talk about the committee assignments. So if there was more information that would have been given at that time, that also would have been acceptable and appreciated, but there was zero communication, which I'm still open to and would like, and would like to have a council that is not like this, that isn't negative like this, they can just work together. And I understand I don't get to pick my committee assignments, but as also a duly elected official, the citizens also elected me to communicate their voice. And so as not just Scott Thompson, but a representative of the people, I think it's important that my voice be heard. Again, my answer on this one is no. It doesn't matter. <laughs> All votes in? I am not even sure what it was. <laughs> okay, the next this, motion to vote this, on? This, yeah, this vote was, uh, Councilmember Goodson, this vote was to um, approve the two Butte County uh, committee okay. assignments and then postpone the meeting, postpone this item to the 21st. Mm -hmm. So with four no's, two yeses, and one abstention, this matter does not pass. So the second motion will now be voted on, which was uh, approve the two Butte County assignments and postpone the rest to a special meeting next week. Mm -hmm. Wednesday. I'm sorry? On Wednesday. Well, it'll have to be scheduled. I mean, I, yeah. if yeah. you want to schedule now, we can, but the, but the, right. the comment was postpone it to a special meeting next week. Okay. Councilmember Thompson, how do you vote? Yes. Motion carries with six yeses and one no. And for clarification purposes, I'll 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 task um, uh, Jackie with with checking the schedules of council members to see when they're available for a meeting. I did hear Mr. Thompson say Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, that he is available, so check your calendars and, and Jackie will be in touch. Okay. 
Next item on the agenda, uh, again, we have at the back of our agenda public communication hearing of any non-agenda items. If anyone uh, came later to the meeting, we offer this opportunity for you to speak on a non-agenda item. Do we have any cards? Mr. Mayor, I do not have any blue speaker cards on this item. And I do not have anyone raising their hand on the Zoom. Well, thank you. We'll move on to council announcements and reports. Any council announcements? Vice Mayor Smith. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I did attend the ORAC meeting um, this past Friday. I would just encourage the public to uh, you know, begin monitoring that. Of course, it, uh, the acronym is Orville Recreational Advisory Committee, and it, uh, it, it works with uh, all the various uh, stakeholders from DWR. Um, uh, there's just a, a, a host of, this, of different agencies that are there and also uh, nonprofits. Um, and I just think it's important just to stay uh, tapped into that as to what's, what is going on. Um, I did bring forth a couple of uh, concerns that uh, elicited some action items from DWR. Um, one uh, in particular, there was a concern raised um, by, uh, by FERP, uh, the acronym FERPA and uh, Feather uh, River Parks District the folks uh, by, I think Shannon's on that board, uh, Kent Fowler's on that board, and then also their uh, manager, um, Ms. Anton was there, and they questioned why they're not on ORAC. And this ORAC deals with all the recreational issues relating to the lake and, of course, uh, around uh, the FERC boundaries, which is down into the after bay, four bay, middle four bay, um, and the hatchery itself. So it, it really deals with a large area. And, and they, they questioned DWR in particular. DWR informed them that we were oper they're operating under the 94, uh, direction from FERC, not to 2006. Um, and, and so uh, this is, I, I just forgive me, I know what's late and we all want to go, but this is just really important to our community um, with the licensing, the dam, all that's going on there. Uh, and so when the dam is relicensed, and for some that they feel that's a foregone conclusion, ORAC will go away and a new committee will arise uh, under that 2006 um, licensing and it'll be RAC, uh, the acronym RAC, uh, at, at which time Feather River Parks District will actually have a seat at um, that they don't currently. So I had suggested uh, as a gesture of, uh, of good policy that, that we start an exploratory committee including Feather River Parks District um, to participate in anticipation of the licensing. And I used an example. DWR currently has put together an exploratory committee called TAG. And they're, the, what they're doing there is that they are exploring ways to maintain cold water for the andronomous fish, the, the salmon, the steelhead, uh, so that they uh, are a, you know, a protected species. Uh, it's, it's, it gets very complicated, uh, but uh, just as they've spent a lot of time and energy and money on this TAG committee, there's no funding. The funding is directly related to or connected to the relicensing. But they're doing this in anticipation of for the environment, uh, which I think is very important. Environment is important to all of us. But recreation to Oroville, it's a multi-billion dollar industry, is also very important to Oroville. And so uh, I am proposing that we begin that now, just as they're doing for the environment, they also do for our community. Uh, they begin that exploratory process. So it, I did generate an action item on DWR's behalf, and so there'll be more to come, but it's a big deal. I mean, uh, when that dam gets relicensed, we're talking a billion dollars of, of money will begin to flow in projects into Oroville. The SBF will be made whole. That's a million dollars plus into the city of Oroville annually. So this is, this is big stuff, and I think it's important to be ahead of that curve so that we know where we're going, we know what the will and interest are of the community. And uh, so I, I, this is just big stuff. It's important, and I think that the community needs to be aware of it, that uh, you know, change is coming. Um, it, it always is. There's nothing we can do about it. It will be here at some point. So thank you. That's 
a lot said, but um, it's important. Councilman Weber. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so uh, last night we held our uh, third uh, meeting for our um, Community Action and Safety Coalition of Orville in partnership with the Downtown Neighborhood Watch with Terry Tata. And I, I just wanted to just report that we, uh, I couldn't begin to even understand in my wildest dreams how much of a, a response this has elicited from the, uh, uh, from the uh, community, it's just been amazing. This is a citizen-led initiative of citizen stakeholders who just really are proactive in their approach to our community. Uh, you can't believe the caliber of people that are coming along. There, we got some amazing youth initiative action going right now with partnering with the, the Axiom and um, Levi came and gave a, a wonderful presentation um, last night and then he also um, spoke very highly of uh, Council Member Riggs and your dedication to that organization over the years and how you helped spearhead it to where it is today. And the legacy lives on, in other words. And, uh, and there's all this collaborative work going on between all these really great folks that are coming together. And I just, just to see it unfolding and developing has been really something else. I mean, I'm super appreciative of all the input and super appreciative of the participation. I'm looking forward to what this thing is going to do because I think that we're uh, modeling some really cool stuff. Um, Council Member Johnstone was there, Vice Mayor Smith was there, uh, Chief Legrone was there, along with um, who else was there? No, nobody else was there. Pastor Bill Spear was there. But uh, just an amazing collaboration of people. And Terry Todd, of course, you were there. I, 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 <laughs> I, I, I just mentioned you. Um, so uh, anyway, just an amazing. I just I can't say enough good work, good words about this thing. I'm really excited about what's happening, and I'm super excited to watch this thing develop. It's awesome, really cool. So there's my my little presentation. Okay. Anyone else, council members? Uh, I'm going to make a quick announcement that uh, for the next meeting we. And working with uh, the Buttes, uh, no, excuse me, the what's the name of it? the Sutter Butte Levy Protection District will be making a presentation at our next city council meeting, um, mostly because we we met them at the Damn Citizen Advisory Committee meeting, and um, we asked them. I say we, uh, Supervisor Bill Conley and myself, to make a presentation to the city because there's a section of the levy that uh, isn't really protected very well that we have along the city. So they'll be here and I certainly recommend you all to check out that presentation. It's really informative about the levies and what they've done from the After Bay outlet south of the river to, um, uh, to Yuba City. So that presentation will be here and hopefully we'll get some good input and the potential of joining with them on their expertise in delivering the the uh, technology and the training and the, the things that they've been doing to the levy has been really a good thing. And hopefully it'll help preserve our community and keep our levy, keep the high water away from us. <laughs> um, any others? How about uh, part, uh, um, any future agenda items from council? Seeing none, uh, administrative reports. I did, wanted to get an update perhaps on where we are with the ROP um, program. The I had a brief conversation with uh, Dr. Lamar Collins from the Los Lumos High School last night, and we are in the beginning parts of that in those conversations to see what all that entails and you know how we incorporate our students into that. Okay, thank you. Good. And any other uh, department head administration reports? Mr. Mayor, I have nothing to report, but I do have a question for the council. The, um, on Saturday night, there's going to be the uh, Rotary Roundup that we held at the convention center here in town up on the levee, the old municipal auditorium for those who are um, listening to the old name. What I'm interested in from the council is if the council, uh, by consensus, is interested in going to the Rotary Roundup. If so, um, you know, I can... Uh, facilitate that by acquiring those tickets and getting an appropriate number of those tickets to t attend the event. So I'm looking just to see if the council is interested in going to that, and if so, who is interested. What have we done in the past? We've done various uh, different events in the past. The 
I seem to remember that we have done the Rotary Roundup in the past. Uh, we've also done the Chamber uh, events. We've done the Economic Conference events. Um, there's been several of those events that we attend. There are community events of uh, community groups that give back to the public. It's a good opportunity for the council to uh, network with the community and to relay those um, things that are occurring within government to uh, you know people within our community. It's an it's an outreach thing uh, for our council. I would have no problem with it. I would just say have individual council members get a hold of you and go from there. That works. What about? <laughs> okay cool all right i think i'm seeing enough heads voting yes i will uh, send that email out and then i can say the union's cooking so whatever whatever they're preparing that'll be uh see any other administration reports department heads go yes. ahead don <laughs> Oh, no, I was just saying, yes, there are. <laughs> uh, for an update on our State Route 162 sidewalk project, we have two remaining parcels that we are negotiating with the property owners for right-of-way acquisition. Uh, once we receive that, we are bundling our application to the um, CTC committee, and then from there we will hopefully, fingers crossed, obtain our encroachment permit, and we can complete the sidewalk project that will span from Highway 70 up Orodam Boulevard, uh, and on east to um, Olive Highway to Foothill Boulevard. And so that'll be a com complete connection of curb gutter and sidewalk and bike lanes up uh, our main thoroughfare. Uh, behind that, Caltrans will come through and do their repaving project of Oro Dam and Olive Highway, which will be a huge improvement for the community. Um, with that, will become will also come restriping of Olive Highway to make it... Um, two lanes in the westbound direction, I believe. Uh, also, there we have two contract, two new contract fire marshals. Um, the other fire marshal had a new assignment, and so we have uh, two new gentlemen that will be here Tuesdays and Thursdays. One will be behind the scenes doing plan review. The other fire marshal will be here physically present doing uh, inspections for construction projects. Uh, I've been working with Explore Butte County on a new wayfinding signage project that will be countywide, and it will have um, wayfinding signs that will be consistent throughout each community, but color coordinated for each community's um, character. Uh, but it'll highlight major points of interest in each of those communities. So we're working on that. It's uh, in coordination with Butte County, um, so we can apply for grant funding for that, and it'll be a consistent um, signage throughout the region. And then we also had our first community meeting for the Feather River Parkway Master Grant uh, at the January 31st Park Commission meeting. It was good attendance, great feedback from the public, um, great comments, and so we will be hosting other community meetings uh, in the coming months in anticipation of a grant application with the California State Parks grant funding, uh, NOFA, and that's also the same funding that we had applied for and were awarded funding for the uh, Hewitt Park project, which is also underway. The final design plans uh, will be complete in the next 30 to 60 days, and that will go out to bid to the public um, contractors, and so we hope to break ground on that in June, July of this year. Ruth? Well, I first want to welcome Brian Ring. <laughs> I got to work with him at the county. I really appreciate you stepping in, and I'm looking forward to supporting you in any way I can. So thank you. Thank you for coming over. Um, I have to mention that Tracy and I are going to be at a um, LP varsity basketball game. You can see she's sporting her jersey. <laughs> she has a son on the varsity team, and so we're going to be, I have a son who coaches it, so uh, we'll be there tonight. So go T-Birds. Yeah. Sorry, all you Oroville fans. <laughs> 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 and now for the fun stuff, I'm looking um, for direction from the council regarding budget. It is budget season. Are you interested in having a budget workshop? It is customary to do a priorities and goal setting workshop it's um, in the past I have done a whole workshop just and gone over every single line of our revenue so that you know uh, where the money's coming from and then the next one we did all expenditures and so you kind of do the revenues first to see how much you have to start with and then to see how we allocate it with the expenditures but I'm looking for direction 
Um, I think what I'm, I'm planning on doing is on the next agenda, I'll put a budget timeline on the agenda and okay. we can all maybe discuss it and, and see. I know I would really like to have the city administrator sure. uh, there for that. So I don't know if you want to delay it or I'm just looking for direction on how to proceed with the budget and what you would like to see. My done. preference would be let's get the city administrator on duty and then we'll okay. get it planned out. Yeah. Okay, I'll put a timeline on the yeah. next agenda and then we can go okay. from there. Any other comments, department heads? Folks, we have to return to closed door session, so you're welcome to stay, but uh, there probably won't be anything coming out of the closed door, so. Mr. Mayor, I think Councilperson Riggs had. Oh, something. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Thank you. I just wanted to know what the, gym, the response was for gym memberships from the oh, city yeah. employees. How'd that go over? It actually went over very well. Um, we went over the allocated numbers that we have in there, but we're working with the gym to do a trial for the first few months to see who everybody initially is interested, but who's actually going to use it. So we're gonna resize once we get a couple months into this and see what we're actually doing. Thank you, and then I had another one. Go do ahead. we have an expected date for our new uh, street striper? Are we going to throw it a party? Yes, I received an update from our uh, public works manager. No party yet. We expect it in April. So, okay. I know. Cool. Very good. Great. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll move to closed door session now. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Signing off. Good night, everybody.